Today, I want you to look at the world a little differently through the eyes of a child. I was a very curious child. And I always asked my teachers lots of questions. And whilst it might look like I was the teacher's pet, in fact, I was probably a bit of a pain. I wouldn't take no for an answer. And I increasingly got frustrated that I felt like they weren't telling me the full story. As we moved from primary school to secondary school and the layers of understanding unfolded, you find out that it wasn't quite right what they taught you in primary. Some subjects were guilty of this more than others. Maths was particularly guilty. Just when you got the hang of a gradient of a line, they came on and introduced a third dimension. It was all very frustrating. And the pattern continued for me through to university, and I slowly realized I would never have complete knowledge of everything. But I could still keep asking questions. Whilst I think we all start off as children with this eagerness to explore boundaries and ask questions, sometimes we lose that when we grow into adulthood. Today I want to ask why, and I want to whisk up your own curiosity. Curiosity is an essential part of any creative process, but it's not just a passive sense of open-mindedness. You've got to actively engage with it, to explore. Asking questions leads you to discover new things. I think it's this curiosity that led me to become an engineer. In my job in aerospace research, I work with future aircraft, and asking difficult questions is literally part of my job description. Why do aircraft look a certain way? How might that change in the future with new technology? And most importantly, what is the correct etiquette for reclining your seat on a flight? Well, we're still working on that one. A few years into my job, I faced a slightly more difficult career-based question. What next? You see, I've been following a bit of a treadmill of milestones going through life. Finish school, check. Get to university, don't fail it, check. Get a decent job, check. Finish the graduate scheme, check. And then all of a sudden, this map that I'd subconsciously been following ran out. It was over to me. I realized I needed a challenge and something to give me direction. In hindsight, applying to bake in a tent in front of millions of people on a very well-known TV program was a bit of a rogue strategy. <laughs> it was a fascinating learning experience, but it had some unintended consequences. I started getting some exciting opportunities. I got the tantalizing offer to bake live on daytime television. Whilst I was expertly showing the audience at home how to cut a butternut squash, I nearly took a finger off with one kind media outlet calling it a bloodbath. When you're trying new things, failure is always going to be part of the process. On one hand, these baking and media opportunities felt like they needed to be seized and were time limited. But on the other, everything I'd worked for since primary school had been to become an engineer. Baking felt a bit frivolous. I'd applied to the show to give me some direction, but now confusingly, I was being pulled in multiple ones. Things continued to get busier, and I started to struggle to juggle. And then one day, I got a phone call. It was from a colleague, and she was quite mysterious in tone and said, would I mind making a cake for a special visitor who might be coming to work? I said, yes. She said, even better if it's got an engineering theme. I agreed. It was only a few days later they told me it was for Prince William visiting, and if I'd have known beforehand, my answer might have been different. To say I lost sleep over it is a bit of an understatement, but I was really proud of the result. I made a jet engine cake, and not only did it have gingerbread fan blades, they span too. It had an internal skeleton. I had to learn how to cast caramel, and oh, I sweated over chocolate cake fan tip clearances. There was real engineering in this cake. It fundamentally changed my perspective. I began to see more opportunities to introduce engineering and science into my baking techniques. I made a geode cake using super saturated sugar solution, which is the same mechanism by which real geodes form with super saturated minerals. When a caramel bar I'd made kept breaking under load, I realized I could use strawberry laces attached to it 
to reinforce it, just like steel is used in concrete. This sort of combining of disciplines started to unblur the baking and engineering parts of my brain. I call it baconeering. I'm trying to get it into the dictionary. <laughs> and this unusual combination, I realized you could explore the foundation and fundamentals of engineering, but in a really accessible way. Now, baconeering is best demonstrated with a practical example. So if you'd like to come with me, we're going to go on a brief journey up to orbit. Now, the most exciting but also hazardous part of any journey to space is actually when you come back. It's in the re-entry. This is when we slam into the atmosphere to slow down. Imagine holding your arm outside the window of a car and feeling the air resistance. It's like that, but a lot more exciting. NASA astronaut Doug Wheelock described it like going over Niagara Falls in a barrel, but the barrel's on fire. <laughs> if that doesn't sound exciting, I don't know what is. But he had a point. The outside of the shuttle can reach temperatures of 1,400 degrees Celsius because it has to slow down from 17,000 miles an hour down to just 500. It also turns out that 1,400 degrees is very similar to the temperature inside a butane blowtorch. <laughs> this is the bacon earring. A retro dessert can offer us some insights, and it starts over here. We've got a lovely sponge base that's got to protect some very precious cargo. In this case, far more delicious than astronauts. It's an ice cream dome. Now, what I've got to do is I'm about to introduce some quite nasty heat to this ice cream. And just like when I'm bringing astronauts back from orbit, I have to protect them from the heat, I need to introduce a barrier here. And in my case, that comes in the form of a meringue. Now, what I've got here is a Swiss meringue, slightly more stable than its French counterpart. And <laughs> I've introduced a lot of air into it by whisking the egg whites and sugar together. And the sugar acted like little shovels, bringing air into the mixture. And air is a fantastic insulator. It's why we use it in double glazing. It's why we use it in blankets and insulation in our attic. But the key is you have to keep the air in pockets. The air in this room is free to convect around, and that's not much use. So you have to give it pockets to give it the structure. That's also why, if you were to taste some of this meringue after it had been in the freezer, it would actually taste warm. Humans are actually very bad at perceiving temperature. What we perceive instead is heat transfer. That's why on that late night creep to the toilet, the tiles feel so much colder than the carpet. The carpet's got lots of air in it, so it's a better insulator. All this is to say that when I introduce this harsh heat, the precious icy cargo on the inside is protected because of that barrier of air pockets. Now, thankfully, engineers can do a little bit better than egg whites. Let me introduce you to the Buran. Now, the Buran was the Soviet equivalent of the space shuttle. Some would say it bears a striking resemblance to the space shuttle. But what I want you to look at is what's on the bottom, those black tiles that we have. And they're made up of millions of pockets of air because it's made of silicon oxide. And I've got one of those tiles right here. And the amazing thing with these tiles, if I show you a close up on this, is that I can blowtorch this for minutes and minutes and minutes. And that spot of heat will stay in exactly the same place. It is an incredible insulator because of those pockets of air. Now, at this point, you might be wondering, Andrew, come on, be serious. There can't be that much of a comparison between baked Alaska and a Buran tile. Well, I'm an engineer, and I like data. And thankfully, due to some researchers at Tokyo Yasai University, we have the data, thermal conduction in egg albumin foam. That's meringue to you and me. And the entire paper is in Japanese, of which I do not speak, but I only needed the tables. So let's do a little comparison. Turns out meringue is a bit of a miracle material. It's got a comparable density and volume by air compared to the Buran, but it's this last number that I'm really interested about, the conductivity. The lower this number is, the better the insulator. Now, what does this mean? Well, if I was to replace all the tiles on the bottom of my shuttle, with meringue, 
I would only need three times the thickness. <laughs> only three times. And some of you, the sharp ones in the audience, might be realizing that you know, there is a small flaw in the plan. The amount of sugar means it's quite flammable, so it'd be lots of flames initially. But if I was traveling on the International Space Station and I was an astronaut, I'd be carrying some spare egg whites and a palette knife just in case I needed to make any touch-ups. <laughs> now, retro desserts aside, there is some serious points to make here about multidisciplinary thinking in engineering. Take, for instance, xanthan gum. So it was discovered in the 1960s as a food additive. It's very common in gluten-free baking. It's now used in structural engineering to help set concrete underwater. It is an incredible thickening agent. Or what about candy floss? The patents for the first candy floss machine appeared in the early 20th century. And in the last 10 years, companies have been able to use the floss method to take plastic waste and turn it into cheap insulation for refugee camps. There's some serious thinking to be done at this overlap in the middle, this baconeering bit. Baconeering, for me, has led me to have opportunities on the other side of the camera, making and producing things I could only have dreamed of before. We called it Baking Impossible. We brought together teams of baconeers and challenged them to use their curiosity to discover new materials like edible glues. And they broke boundaries. They made edible buildings that could withstand an earthquake. They made crash test vehicles with marshmallow bumpers. <laughs> this interesting intersection between baking and engineering is the fun bit. It's the curious bit. And it's where a community has built behind this. Kids now are trying experiments at home to do their own baconeering bits. Baconeering has taught me the value of that childlike eagerness to ask questions. It's that interesting bit in the middle of my interests. That's where curiosity happens. And I think we all have multiple talents and passions in life. And just because somebody else hasn't told you you can't do it before doesn't mean you can't carve out your own path. What are the silos you have in your life that you can break down and bring together? And yes, there might be some not so tasty failures along the way, but I almost guarantee there will be some delicious discoveries. So whether you're a nurse who likes mountaineering or a builder who likes particle physics or just a humble baker who likes engineering, there is a way you can have your cake and eat it. Thank you.